Hey there, interwebs, and welcome back to How Fascinating, the series which long ago I realized was tailor-made to turn you into that guy at the party. You know the one, the kind of person who doesn't seem to be an expert on any one subject, but who can go on for five minutes about seemingly uninteresting subjects like horseshoe crabs, ampersands, or forklifts, or indeed ancient Roman beverages, which is what today's video will be about. Before I continue, I want to give credit where it's due. The Metatron has already made a video about Roman beverages, and you should totally watch it if you haven't already. It's what inspired me to make this video, so I'll be referring back to it later, and I have some further additions. Not just additions to his work on Roman beverages, mind you, but additions to the beverages themselves. Let's start with the obvious one. Lead. The Latin word for lead is plumbum, which is why its chemical symbol is PB. The word plum means straight up and down, because plumb lines used lead weights at the bottom. It's also where we get the word plumbing, because the Romans used lead pipes for their drinking water, which history proved to be a mistake. Lead poisoning from their water pipes is one of the factors often blamed for the fall of the Roman Empire, but I have to disagree with that idea. What's more, I disagree with the very premise that the Roman Empire even fell in the first place. It got too big, underwent imperial mitosis in 286 AD, survived in the east in Byzantium for over a thousand more years, and is still alive, in a way, in the west today in the form of the Catholic Church. Why the hell else do you think Latin is still used in the liturgy? Pipeline-induced declines aside, lead still found its way into Roman beverages by another method. It was used as a sweetener. You see, Roman wines could be on the tart or bitter side, and so they added various ingredients to sweeten it. One of the more popular additives was honey, but another was known as sugar of Saturn. Also known as sugar of lead, this was lead to acetate, and it's a white crystalline compound with a very sweet taste. The Romans created their wine by boiling grape juice in lead-lined pots, where the compound seeped in, thereby sweetening it. Incidentally, lead compounds were also used to produce white paints up until relatively recently. This is why you've probably heard of the dangers of lead-based paint, and chips of this paint which flake off, if eaten, would taste relatively sweet. Back when she was a child, my girlfriend was once asked by her doctor if she had eaten paint chips. She said no, but she thought, why, should I? There's also a character in a comedic fantasy novel I'm working on who complains that first the government tells us we're not allowed to use lead in our water pipes, next they'll be telling us we can't put it in our wine either. He also mentions adding it to lamp oil. Although I know of no historical instances of lead being added to lamp oil, it was once an additive in a different liquid fuel, gasoline. This practice was banned in 1996, which is why regular gasoline these days is still marketed as unleaded. Let's get back to weird Roman beverages, though. Would you like a refreshing cup of vinegar? What if I told you it's really good? Because it is. In addition to wine, the Romans also had a popular non-alcoholic beverage called posca, and this was, in essence, just watered-down vinegar. Other ingredients like honey or spices could be added, but at its most basic it was just a mixture of vinegar and water, and you know what? It's actually quite refreshing. As a matter of fact, I enjoyed a glass of it at time of writing, and I'm having a second glass right now as I record to keep my throat from getting too dry. I encourage everyone to try it at least once, but I have to warn you, the first sip will definitely taste weird. In his video, Raffaello tried a mixture of ten parts water to one part vinegar, and he said, At first it's a little strange, but it is an acquired taste. I mean, I don't dislike it. And, after drinking three or four sips, I'm already getting used to it, and I'm starting to enjoy it. I saw this and thought, what the hell, I'll give it a shot, and so I did. Raffaello was bang on the money, too. The first sip is like drinking straight vinegar. The second sip is like drinking diluted vinegar. On the third sip, you can start to detect different flavors, and they're weird. The fourth sip is still weird, but after that, it's actually really refreshing. I've heard Posca described as an ancient Roman energy drink, and yeah, that feels about right. In the modern rogue video where they try taste tripping with miracle berry pills, they drink white vinegar straight from the bottle, and Brian says, If you told me that on the first hit I was having some new formulation of lemon-lime Gatorade, I would have believed you. I prefer a water-to-white vinegar ratio of 8 to 1 for a nice, crisp, almost citrusy beverage, but there are plenty of other ratios and recipes out there. Toss in a few ice cubes and a wheel of lemon, and you'll get a flavor which I can only describe as electric lemon and possibly too yellow, because synesthesia is weird. Your word of the day is synesthesia. If you can get some red wine vinegar or a good apple cider vinegar and add some whole cloves, you, my friend, have a delicious summer beverage. If all this wine and vinegar is too acidic for you and gives you a tummy ache, you might just try washing it down with a few pearls. Just crush them up, mix them into your drink of choice, and toss it back. People from numerous ancient cultures used crushed pearls as antacids, and that's because they worked. Expensive, yes, but effective. That's because pearls are made of a material called nacre, or mother of pearl, which is just another kind of calcium carbonate. That's the same structure which makes up seashells, obviously, but also eggshells, stalactites and stalagmites, and, most relevantly, tums. If you dissolve powdered calcium carbonate in the form of crushed pearls, for example, in water, you'll get an aqueous nacreous solution which is mildly alkaline and which would help to neutralize excess acid in the stomach. The people of the past might not have known how it worked, but that's not a prerequisite to knowing that it worked. As I've said before, the ancients were ignorant, but they weren't stupid. 
Perhaps the most famous case we have of someone drinking a pearl comes in the story of Cleopatra's wager. In it, the Egyptian queen allegedly bet Mark Antony that she could throw a ridiculously expensive dinner party just as a pure display of her kingdom's wealth and might. According to Pliny, yes, him again, she won by dropping her pearl earring worth an estimated 10,000 sesterces into her goblet of wine where it dissolved, allowing her to drink it and win the bet. Talk about conspicuous consumption, am I right? The exact value of the pearl and the specific nature of the bet vary from telling to telling, as do all the other details, but the science at the core of the story is sound. A pearl will dissolve in a weak acid like wine or vinegar, if you're willing to wait a day or two. Science! And that little anecdote about opulent decadence just about brings an end to this video. If I've inspired you to give Posca a try, please let me know in the comments, along with the recipe you'll use and how it goes. As always, thanks for watching, and have a fascinating day.